What is going on? It's Alex going back at you with another video. And today I am breaking down my top 17 corners in the 2024 NFL draft. If you are new, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. You guys know how to use YouTube. It would be wonderful for you to hop on the hype train. I know there's going to be a lot of dissension, a lot of anger down in the comment section below, but this is just me giving you my honest opinion. The fact is, this is a very, very good corner class. So buckle up. There's going to be a lot of very unique takes, but I'll never do something unique to be unique. I'll just do it if I genuinely believe that's the case. So, yes, I know my list is going to be completely different than everybody else's on planet Earth, but that's why we're here. Whether you want it for entertainment or you just want it for, you know, actual information, that's going to be up to you. But we're going to have a good time nonetheless. This is how I grade. So I'm going to be doing this at the beginning of every single video because I changed my grading scale. Basically, this is going to be split into different tiers. Now, you'll see the numbers like 1 through 17 on the top left, but they're broken down into different roles that I see the player in. So, for example, if a player randomly is the 12th overall on my board, they might be the 12th best corner. But if they are in tier 2, I think they can be an every down starter. And y'all know me. I am a pessimist. I do not think players should be getting starting reps very often. So keep that in mind and definitely keep that in mind when we start going through this video, because I already know that people are going to get grouchy about a lot of things. But the categories that I do look over, we got man coverage ability that kind of pairs up with the speed change of direction, et cetera, right? That obviously is going to be blended into other categories, but there needs to be at least one main focus. So we understand the respective strengths and weaknesses of these players. Same thing with zone, then straight line speed. Now, I am debating adding into a burst category like an explosiveness category, but of course, there's you have to take away points from a certain category because this is out of 100 to be able to add. So keep that in mind as well. Uh, we got instincts, which is going to be basically the proper timing and just overall the natural fluidity of the mental processing of the game. You got physicality, press coverage, how physical are you? Pretty self-explanatory. Ball skills. This basically comes down to PBUs, interceptions, like primarily that. But of course, I'm going to add a little bit of weight for the players who I think do better than their statistics. It's not going to be a category that's very glorious for many players. I'll give you that. I don't think there's any player that even got an A in this category. But actually, I think there's one. But still, like not many players actually get proper uh, ball skills in you know, that's okay. Not every player is going to be a seven interception guy in the NFL. That happens. Run support, self-explanatory. Can you actually help out with the run? And frame, also self-explanatory based on, you know, are you around six foot plus? Are you around 190 to 195 plus? Then you're going to be getting an A plus in this factor. So this is all based off of a numerical grading scale. Let's have a great time though. Again, this is here for your entertainment and your information because I know that my list is going to be completely different than everybody else's. But the first player is going to be Kalen King. Now, I think that he has had an astronomical drop off, but we have seen in 2022 that he was a first round quality corner. I don't know what the hell happened. Honest to God, I have no idea what happened because he was a really damn good corner number two. Now, he tested out in the four sixes. Not a fan of that personally. Like he really has had a very bad offseason. It needs to be almost studied, but I still think he can play either a slot or maybe like a rotational defensive back where he can play safety. He can play slot. This is going to be corner four, right? I'm not going to say that this guy even sees the field. Quick reference. Yes, you got three. You got four to one. And just a quick little information. When I have someone as a corner four, I think that they can either be one tier higher or one tier lower. That's generally the good range for them to be based on how their career is going to go. Now, if they suck, they can drop two tiers. If they're really good, they can go up two tiers. I doubt that he'd ever, ever become a corner one on a team. But if he rebounds, I think he'd be a really good corner two. Think of it that way. So uh, there is technically one higher tier. That's like an S tier, like a top two corner in the NFL. Like that's going to be almost impossible to do day one unless you're Sauce Gardner. Some people call it generational tier. But I'm going to allow you guys to essentially read a lot of this stuff. It factor is there in case I don't feel like something like motor or something is very well represented by the scale. It's more of a checks and balances on myself. But Cam Hart is next. This one breaks my heart. But think of it this way. Cam Hart is still in my top 80 players in the draft. Keep that in mind. Top 80, 16. 
top 80. Just keep that in mind, right? He is top 80 on my board. I love this guy. He is physical. He might not be very smart with his physicality. That's my one issue with him. I think he needs to work on the intricacy of when he is physical, but he's actually really sticky in man. I just don't think he's super duper fluid. He tested out very, very well. Now, there's a lot of really good tape on him. I do think he allows a little bit too much separation, and I don't really feel he's very comfortable in zone coverage. And I think that's going to continue improving as time goes on. He's been around Morrison for such a long time there at, at Notre Dame now that you know, I think that his game has continued to elevate and I've seen a progression each year getting better and better and better. I think this guy is easily able to be a corner three right away. I think he could develop into a corner two, hence why he is now in the corner three territory. I think that there are literally 16 players who will come in and get genuinely almost starting reps. It's a ridiculously good class. And I think corners are, I think situations that really value that physicality, Jacksonville, Balky loves his physicality. The uh, the Colts, I mean, hell, you're talking about Juju Brents last year, Jalen Jones, like this is exactly their physical build for a corner. Also makes sense for the Colts, they're right down the road. And then of course the Lions, they love physicality, they love guys who just go pound to the, like pedal to the metal, right? So I really do like Cam Hart. I think that, you know, statistically speaking, he's never been somebody to rack up the PBUs. He's never been that guy. He has the long arms where I think that can easily improve, but it's just not really there. I don't see him always turning around for the ball. And that's something that, you know, you got to be a realist here. I don't really see him being an asset at all in the run support. A lot of guys are going to get pretty poor run support grades as well. You know, missed tackles or, you know, just not really having that initiative to go and assist in the run. I didn't see that with Cam. And that's surprising because he has an unbelievable frame at 6'3", 202. So I just got to leave it right there. He's a great player. Again, I think that he is on the fringe of actually starting for a roster. And he will most likely be going in day three or day two, excuse me, on the, you know, mid to later end. And that is perfectly fine. And I think he will end up, you know, developing continually. And then he will become a very, very good corner too. Now we got Kyrie Jackson. This guy's a beast. He's like 6'4", 200 pounds. Like, talk about, like, look at these physical freaks. 6'3", 202, 6'4", 200, damn near. Like, I love it. I love it. Great arm length. Like, you know, great physicality. Like, I think Kyrie is a little bit more polished in terms of the physicality. And he's a little bit older. He's a form of Bama corner as well. So that's where I could see he's very smart when it comes to using his physicality. But I think he's really stiff. Uh, he is pretty damn solid in the straight line for speed. Most of the speed is, you know, play speed times what they did in the 40 yard dash. Cause that's a really, uh, in also 10 yard split. Cause that's a relatively good way to measure it. But, you know, I think that his overall coverage didn't wow me. Now, everything a seen above is adequate. You got to remember that. Like my scale is very, very big pain in the ass. Like players don't get B's unless they really deserve it. Like, you really have to earn a B. And then, hell, if you get to an A, that's God tier. Like, that is NFL starter material. So very rarely will you see anybody who is not going to be listed as an actual starter with an A in any category. So Kyrie Jackson is still a really solid corner, adequate in his coverage ability. I just think he's a little bit too stiff for me to be a day one starting corner. But I think teams that really do value that physicality, they love that bigger build. And you know what? They're willing to work with somebody who does put in the effort and is going to be someone who like adds some good depth where if you need him to step in, he'll play well. That's exactly what Kyrie Jackson brings to the table. So I still think, you know, based on his age and everything, if I'm not mistaken, he's going to be 25, if not 26. Like, that's why I think he'll be going a little bit into day four. But that's because how damn good this class is very well might be a third round pick. So do that as you will. Now we got Dwight McLaughlin, one of my favorite corners in this draft. Uh, you know, he was my corner four coming into the year, ended up being corner 14. Do you know why? Not because he fell, but because how damn good this class is. Remember, he's a corner three on a roster. I think he is off man. He's basically, if you swap the zone coverage ability of Eli Ricks with off man ability at Bama versus at Arkansas, of course. So in college, you'd be getting... Dwight McLaughlin. Like I get very similar vibes in terms of the faith I have in their ability in the right situation. 
So Dwight McLaughlin very well could end up developing into a very talented corner. And, you know, he's also going to be around that 80 to 75 range on my board. A lot of these guys are going to be very closely clustered. You look at those overall grades, that will give you a tendency to understand where I have these guys uh, placed. But I don't really feel like the zone coverage ability is there. His instincts are a little bit off, but definitely they are boosted because he has very solid timing and off-man coverage. Uh, his ball skills, certainly he does get quite a few interceptions, and I just think there's not very much that's wrong with him. I just also think that, you know, he's not the most explosive guy. The testing certainly proved that, and he also doesn't have the best wiggle. So uh, wide receivers who are very sudden, very well might be able to get good separation on him. That's why I like him in off man, because he can just come downhill and use that speed rather than having to be multi-directional. So next we got Kamari. This is where people are going to lose their shit. I'm just going to call this out right now. He is number 46 on my board. Do not come at me for saying I do not like Kamari Lasseter. He is 46th on my board. I love this class. There is nothing wrong with Kamari Lasseter, except for the fact that he plays like he's 180 pounds. He can get moved by bigger receivers very well, and he does not adjust very well. That's my issue with him. He is more role specific than what I would really like compared to some of these other corners that are a little bit more ready day one to be able to face all types of wide receivers. So I love him. I swear, I'm going to come after those people who come at me in the comment section. Like Kamari is 46. I have it sitting right here. That's how much faith I have in this corner class. Granted, that also talks about some of the other positions and how little depth there is, but or how little top tier talent there is in this class. But I think he can actually be a corner too. This is where you get starting quality corners in this class. He is a French corner too for me. I think he can play boundary, absolutely. He'll be a tweener depending on who's going to be playing in the slot. If you see someone who's a little bit on the smaller side, like an Elijah Moore, I think Kamari will be perfectly fine. The thing is, I love his zone coverage ability. In 2022, I felt like he was much more man heavy based on the fact that his mobility outmatched his mental processing. Totally switched this year. Very rare that you ever see that, but I did. And that's awesome. I love to see you because now you've seen both sides of it. Now improve your man coverage while maintaining your zone ability. You can end up being a true corner too. So I really think Kamari Lasser is right there on that fringe. I'm going to give him the benefit of the doubt, even though technically I shouldn't. I still believe in him to the point where I'm saying, hey, you actually can be a true corner too on a team. I would be willing to take him second round. Absolutely. I think he goes in that range. There's a lot of very good players in this class. Again, no shade to Kamari at all. He's an unbelievable mover. Now, I think he needs to be a little bit more refined in his movement, but he does look very comfortable in zone. And that, to me, is almost worth a little bit more than if you're just going to be a smooth athlete in man coverage. So shout out to Kamari Laster. That's why, actually, when you look at everything, uh, zone coverage ends up weighing a little bit heavier than the rest of the uh, than man coverage, because I really do want to focus on the instincts, the change of direction definitely is part of that in zone coverage. Uh, it blends into both, but you also have that. So really big fan of Kamari Lasseter. There's not really an issue with his game at all. It's just he's not going to be very physical with the bigger wide receivers. Like Trey Harris absolutely ate his lunch. Granted, Trey Harris is a very formidable opponent, and he very well might be a first round pick next year. So, you know, take it with a grain of salt. Now we got Kamal Hayden. This dude was in the 90s PFF grade wise, but he had some injuries that certainly limited his overall play and tenure there at Tennessee. He's a very, very, very talented corner. And he's one of the first that I actually give a true comp for. I say it's a middle school bully. This guy just absolutely mauls people. He trucks over wide receivers. I love that. He straight up pancakes of dudes as a corner. I thought he was like 6'4", 230. Like genuinely, I thought he might've been a linebacker. And no, this guy is very powerful. Now, I think he is very smooth with his hips in a straight line. But when it comes to his overall play in man coverage, I thought it wasn't very efficient. He didn't test at the combine. He just did some of the drills. And that's fine, right? Uh, he still is actually quite solid in zone. There was a lot of zone there for Tennessee. And I thought he actually looked really comfortable in it for how physical he was because a lot of times these physical corners really do opt to be a little bit closer to the receiver and just you know have more of a man skill set so i do appreciate a corner that has unbelievable strength that can still work with the 
you know, finer side of the game. So shout out to Kamal for that. But I just don't really think that he's a super plus athlete from, you know, the tape that I was able to see. Obviously, this dude's an absolute freak show when it comes to being able to like absolutely level receivers. He's willing to take on. He actually ended up, I believe, hurting his shoulder. Um, I, I don't know what the actual injury was, but I saw it on the tape. He was holding a shoulder like this after he engaged Jalen Milrow on the outside. He went toe to toe with Jalen Milrow full speed and they went into each other full speed. Power to you, bro. Power to you. It That takes some real balls to go after someone who is built like Jalen Milrow is. And Kamal Hayden technically lost that exchange, but he still got Jalen Milrow out of bounds. He lost it because, you know, obviously he got hurt that game. But, you know, big fan of Kamal Hayden there. You just, I mean, you just got to find a good role for him. It's going to be very difficult to, like, I just don't know what his actual projection is going to be. But that physicality and the fact that he can play zone and he has a great build there, 6'1", 200 pounds, like that is a respectable build. I'm very excited to see. Very excited to see where he's going to go. And this is a great day three option. An unbelievable value for day three. Now we got Jarvis Brownlee Jr. Oh, I love Jarvis. Um, He dealt with a foot injury a lot this year. And he was playing on that foot injury towards the latter part of the year where his statistics dropped a bit. He actually hurt himself. He was, I believe, out for a period of time and just said, screw it, I'm going to come back and play on that injury. So, you know, first off, power to him on the motor for that. But also minus one for the fact that, you know, he's still, yeah, he his performance still dropped. You're still playing through an injury, but, you know, when you're a corner, you still need to be adequate. And he did drop his play to a point where I thought it wasn't number 11 worthy. But we do know what he is when he's healthy. And again, power to him for pushing himself to that max limit. He's also a dog. This guy's going to go in and assist in the run, even though at 5'10", you know, he's not going to be someone with unbelievable like physicality 195 is great though got to give that but 510 is not really the size of corner that i want i think he's a good tweener but he is shifty as all get out now his top speed he didn't run in you know the four threes which was surprising honestly his tape feels almost like that but you know he's someone who can play boundary he can play slot he is super fluid as an athlete just someone who i was very excited because he was a completely balanced corner and that's not easy to find now. Not easy to find at all. I'd be perfectly happy with this guy being my starting slot or my starting number two. I honestly would. I think this guy's phenomenal. You know, just is a little bit limited in terms of height. And that's kind of the big issue for me. But this guy was an absolute pleasure to watch. Feel free to go watch him yourself. It really is awesome. Or join the Discord and be able to holler at me because then we'll watch him there. Because I'm perfectly happy watching these guys over again. Kaylin Carson stole my heart. I was like, you know what? Like I watched uh, a little bit of Kalen the year before and I was like, yeah, no, I like him. I like him. I don't know if he's going to challenge, you know, the top 15 guys, but you know, let's test it out. Let's see what happens. Right. And I purposely watched his worst games. I watch a lot of these players worst games. I need to see what NFL offenses are going to do to take advantage of you. I mean, you also need to see their strengths. Sure. But their strengths should pop up even in their weakest games. If they don't, then, you know, that's not really a good corner to have when they can't, can't bounce back, right? Uh, I watched specifically where Kalen ended up letting up two touchdowns versus Keon Coleman. That's one of the main reasons why his speed is a C. He was giving up ground to Keon Coleman. But the short area shiftiness was very commendable. And he was extremely smart. Extremely smart. One of the plays I fell in love with Jalen Jones, right? Like talking about a year ago. He was one of my top guys. So very similar sensation here. Of course, Jalen Jones is 6'2", 200 pounds. That guy was, I mean, he's obviously great there for Indy, but he processed a crosser coming from across the field. Jalen Jones did this as well versus Bama in 2021. He processed a someone crossing, saw it, and then ended up bolting backwards, realizing nobody was going to be there and was able to um, at least identify that. Kalen Carson did the same thing. He really did. He processed and then was able to identify a crosser and straight up booked it. He knew that somebody was going to be developing into an open route. I love that. I eat that shit for breakfast. Like if you're able to recognize what's happening, not just in your area, but everywhere, that's a big plus. And there's a corner that I have at number two, and we'll talk about Quinian in, in a little bit, but he has an issue processing everything that's going on around him. He's more, you know, with the blinders on, being able to lock down who's 
his main target. Kalen Carson processes the whole field. Big plus to Kalen Carson. I love that. Six foot, 200 pounds as well. Excellent frame. Would love for him to be a little bit more assertive in the run game. Absolutely. But, you know, overall, uh, have very, very little quarrels. I think a team that is looking for a value corner, maybe in the third round, like pick 97 for the Eagles, for example, where you can have somebody even, he can play the slot, right? He is physical and he is very smart. That's something I would love. Obviously, the Steelers, you know, if we could fill our corner spots with proper value, that would be great. But, uh, you know, just looking at those defenses that really do utilize that zone coverage, that touch with the mentality side, and then appreciate physicality. That, to me, is exactly where I want this guy to succeed. I think he actually might be one of the steals of the draft. Then we got Nate Wiggins, another one where people are going to be gunning for me. I already know it. You want to know where he is on my board right now? Let's see. Let's see, where is he at on my board? Can you guess? 37th. Don't come at me trying to say I don't like Nate Wiggins. I love Nate Wiggins. I don't love the fact he's 6'1", 173. I think that that is a big red flag for me. And you know what? I'm being polite. Because I give him a D- minus in frame. That's an F frame damn near. Like, if you're sub-170, you're getting an F in the frame. So, I'm being polite, right? I'm being very polite. I could have given him a minus one as well in the it factor. Because I don't like the fact that he's scared shitless of going into the box and helping out. I feel like the run support grade, because he actually is pretty solid when he's not in the box. So I'm giving him respect there. But I'm also knocking him. So I didn't really feel like the grade didn't factor that in properly. Uh, Ball skills wise, he has really good length. Obviously, he tested in the 4.2s and the 40. Grand, maybe that's why he's 173. But I thought he was perfectly fine. Change of direction, he is pretty damn smooth. Again, if you have a B in change of direction, that's really, really respectable. Uh, he processes the game so well. He's one of the best coverage corners in the class. It really comes down to the fact that he's 173 and doesn't have the physicality because of that size to match some of these larger receivers. So it was pretty obvious when he ended up playing against Xavier Leggett, who had the physical upside. And it was pretty obvious that Nate also had, he had the technical upside, but not the physical upside, leading to a very, very entertaining battle. I highly recommend y'all to watch that, but I hope Nate can add a little bit extra weight. I think he'd be a very good asset for any team that would want him in the slot, but I think he can also play on the boundary, especially if he could add that weight back. Now let's talk about Renardo Green. Again, look at the scores, by the way. You, this is going to be another thing to the receivers video that's going to drive people crazy, but they're going to see that number in the top left and not see the grade. Like, again, these guys are corner twos on a team. I think if you have one good corner, this guy could, like one of these players can come in and genuinely play every single snap for you. That's how good they are. So again, keep that in mind. But Renardo Green's super balanced, super balanced. Now, I think this guy is almost cerebral in terms of his processing. My only issue is sometimes he gets a little too ballsy and then he'll almost do a Marcus Peters move where he just basically bails on what he's supposed to do and then goes after what he thinks should be done. I have a little bit of an issue with that, but you know, overall, I mean, this dude is essentially a top 32 guy on my board. Uh, looking at it right now, he is a top 32 player. And where is he at? He is at 31, so barely. But you know, he has a great frame. He tested just around four or five. You know, that's great. He's sub four or five, by the way, too. But he also has really solid production in terms of PBUs, interceptions. He's actually willing to assist in the run support. Blows up screens as well. Oh, if you want to know how to get on my good side, blow up a bubble screen. I'm going to fall in love with you. That's what made me fall in love with Kalen King in the first place. So maybe not the best example there. But, you know, when I see a corner just slice through two wide receivers trying to block them and just blow up a play, mm, mm, I get excited. Renardo Green did that. A couple of the other corners I've already mentioned did that as well. So that's why I love this class. They are my type of corners that I'd want on my team. And I wasn't a big fan of this corner class. I was actually shaming it. I'm like, damn, like I wish Denzel Burke were in here. Like, no need for that. No need for that. No need for that dumbass truck in the background either. But we'll try to, we'll pray to God that they find their way to stop backing up. But still, Renardo Green, fantastic player. He tested out well. He has really good instincts. Some people think he should transfer to safety, but you know, I don't think so. I love his overall game. You know, it just again, that change of direction, I think that might be why people think he should, you know, change positions because he's going to be very good in a straight line. You know, that's going to be more of his game. So 
I think he's going to be perfectly fine, though. He's very physical. Just overall, there's nothing really wrong with his game. There's just maybe little nitpicks that you can have. Now we at number seven, Max Melton. So this was a guy I tweeted out. And I'm like, I found a new top five corner. That should show you. I have two corners that I just randomly fell in love with. Um, but also technically is just one. Um, I ended up boosting one corner above Max Melton. And you'll see in just a second. Uh, but, you know, I boosted up two spots. We'll talk about it when it comes. But Max Melton is someone who, like, it was the first corner that I was watching, uh, you know, post-combine. And it was just one of those things. When I was watching him at the combine, I'm like, I love the way this guy moves. And I started watching him, and I was like, this is my kind of corner. Just fluid hips, really fast in a straight line. You know, he was in that 4-4 range. If I'm not mistaken, he might have even been like 4-3-9. But very fast, very smooth. And in man coverage, this guy's locked down. Like genuinely one of the better players. And you don't even think he's 187. This guy's a dog. Another reason I have a plus one right there for it factor. This guy's a dog. He'll go into the box. He goes and he just, he works his ass off every play. He's running from the other side of the field. I should have given him plus two damn near. I love this guy. This is another guy who I think almost could be a corner one on a team. Hence why he's a corner two. Again, you have range for a corner one. This guy's going to be an absolute, absolute asset to whatever team he's going to go to. I love the motor. I love the physicality. I love the speed. I love the fluidity. This guy's going to work his ass off. I'm a huge fan. Like, just doesn't have the production ball uh, ball skill wise. He doesn't have the PBUs or the interceptions that I think qualify him for being that creme de la creme tier, but he is getting pretty damn close. Uh, he, I think he ended up locking himself as a top 50 prospect at the combine because his play certainly certifies it, but hit the way he moved at the senior bowl or not the senior, senior bowl, excuse me, at the combine certainly showed that he is also just fluid even when you get to see him next to every other athlete. Then you got Kool-Aid McKinstry. Y'all know I love Kool-Aid. I'm not giving up on Kool-Aid. I could have given him a minus one for his like injury factor and stuff and the fact that we don't know how fast he is. Like, I'm being pretty generous with some of this grading. So I'm being a very big optimist. So it's a big asterisk here. It's a big asterisk here because there just really isn't very much tape or excuse me, there's not very much information on who Kool-Aid is as an athlete right now. But I'm going to be very optimistic because on the high level reps that I have seen from Kool-Aid McKinstry, there might not be a better corner in this class. I think he takes some reps off. And I think when he gets burned on those reps, he learns his lesson. He ends up working twice as hard the next play and he ends up playing it flawlessly. He actually is very well balanced between man and zone coverage. I love his physicality usage. He's a good run support corner as well. He has a great frame at six foot, 200 pounds. Like, this is a guy that you want on your roster. And I don't really see there being a big motor issue. Like, he takes some plays off, but a lot of players do. The fact that he at least cares enough to bounce back, I love that. I do love that. And also, shout out to Keelan Carson for that, too. He messed up on a rep. And also, this player who I'll be talking about, number three, they just, like, they smack their helmets when they're pissed. I love corners that get pissed at themselves because, hey, at least you're holding yourself accountable. You don't need to get chewed out by your coach in order to feel chewed out. So uh, shout out to Kool-Aid McKinstry. He is my number 27th player on my board. So that should give you some context there between, you know, corner number 12 or 13 being 46 and corner number six. There is literally less than 20 spots. So let's talk about Cooper DeGene. Yeah. Yeah. Me liking Cooper DeGene. Never would have thought it, huh? Uh, I think this guy is absolute garbage and off-man coverage. That's why I don't really like his instincts too much. He looks uncomfortable in the zone. I think a team that prioritizes their corners to be relatively close to the wide receiver, like I don't need him 10 yards off. That's why I don't like it. I think his timing is off. Him and Quinion Mitchell have this issue. They wait too long to go and get it. That's my big issue. That's why they get targeted as well, by the way. You think about it. That's why they get targeted because they're waiting too long. NFL quarterbacks will slice and dice you up. But again, we'll talk about Quinion in a little bit. Because I do love Quinion, but you know, this is Cooper DeGene time. Uh, I want him to be physical and want him to be close to the wide receiver. And I think he could end up being a top tier safety at the next level. And let me know in the comment section if you want me to include him in my safety rankings, because I do think I classify him as a defensive back. Granted, the way he tested and weighed at the combine to me feels a little bit more skewed 
towards being a pure boundary corner. But 6'1", 203 is a great build. Uh, I think in the right situation, he might be even better than a B-plus in man coverage. Again, B-plus is phenomenal. I've never seen someone who, like, you know, you have Kamal Hayden, who I said is a middle school bully. This is essentially like, we're talking about the biggest, baddest high school bully going to a middle school or a preschool to deal with, you know, kindergartners or sixth graders. Like, that. it is almost unfair. It is unmatched. It is cruel to see Cooper DeGene face up against wide receivers. Almost to a fault. He's pushing receivers off their routes pretty significantly 15 yards downfield. You might love that, and I love to see that he can do that. But in the NFL, you start really doing that, you're going to get flagged. My big issue with Cooper DeGene, I think he's going to get flagged a lot for that. Because especially when he's off coverage and he gets beat, he pushes the hell out of the wide receiver. And again, at least he's not getting toasted. But, you know, you got to watch out for that. So I think the red flag factor for him is the fact that he's going to get a lot of illegal contact downfield. He is very physical, almost to a fault. And I think he relies on that a little too much. Now, he actually improved his change of direction ability. I think he needs to change better direction in all directions, but I still think it is solid overall. Very hard to find someone who'd be better in the run support. So shout out to Cooper. But, you know, just somebody who I have a lot of respect for. And I just hope he goes to the right situation. So I love the Green Bay Packers. That's my dream fit of all dream fits in the entire draft. Cooper DeGene to the Packers. Because he really, really, like that Boston College DC, I'm forgetting his name, like, he or like the DC who's from Boston College, like he loves using heavier physical man abilities. This guy's that. He really is. I'm super excited to see what he can do on this team. But, you know, I think he's not as guaranteed of a prospect as people believe him to be. So shout out to Cooper DeGene, though. He is going to be a great prospect. We'll see how much the leg injury and his overall interview skills. He's kind of a bland dude, but, you know, that's just a little gripe I have. Sometimes I just want my corners to have that energy. It's just a me thing. But at four, we got Ennis Rakestraw Jr. This is asterisk as well. Um, this does actually semi-factor in his overall scoring from the combine, but he's subject to dropping because, you know, 183, not a great frame. I still factored that in, but not a great frame. It's acceptable. You know, 185, that's acceptable. And he's close to six foot, that's acceptable. But it's not great. But then when you combine that with, you know, being around that four or five range in the 40, it's like, man, like you look a bit faster than that on tape. Still buttery smooth. And he said he had injuries. So I'm going to give him that pass on that. But I've seen him be extremely efficient and extremely effective versus LSU wide receivers, whether that's Lacey, Thomas, or neighbors. And I've also seen it versus Georgia versus even Lad McConkey. That was one hell of a fun battle to watch. And that was definitely one that I factored into both of their grading scales. So they're both phenomenal players. And he performed well against phenomenal players. I have a lot of faith in Dennis Rakestraw. He was my corner two for a hot minute. The only reason he's slipping is one, because I fell in love with another player. But two, because you got to test a little better than that. So easily with a rebounded pro day, he could easily bounce back up. But I think at 183, if he can get to 185, 186, I know it doesn't sound like much. Eat a couple of burritos, but if you're not going to be eating a couple of burritos every day, if you're going to be in NFL max shape, maybe you are. Chad Ocho's think I had freaking McDonald's every day. But, you know, if you can play at more of a starting boundary weight, I'm going to think of you a little bit less as a slot because he's played both positions quite well. So I'm hoping that he could be someone who is a little bit more of a tweener, but hopefully a little bit more of a boundary corner because you can't just be, in my opinion, a corner one as a slot corner. Hate to say it, but it's just a little more valuable when you can lock up a true number one wide receiver. Now, having that ability to be a tweener and traveling with a receiver, that could be an asset, but you should be a primarily outside corner that has that ability. Now, this is the crazy one. Yeah, here we go. So, story time. I didn't even know about studying about this guy. I was just like, eh, I don't know if I really want to study this guy. Like, yeah, you know, it is what it is. He locked up Johnny Wilson at the Senior Bowl. Like, that was cool. He popped off to me. I, when I was at the Senior Bowl, I'm like, it's this Kentucky guy. Like, like he looks good. I've never even heard of him, though. I was like, ah, let's watch him. Let's do it. My God. First off, 
I watched this guy run with Lad McConkey step for step on a deep post route. No separation. This guy is in the hip pocket. He still tests out pretty damn well, right? Like he still moves really damn well. I love this guy. I do. He is unbelievable. He is the same physical profile as Terry and Arnold, right? Terry and Arnold's 5'11, 6 foot, 190. Same exact frame, right? Same exact frame. And look at that picture. I mean, it's a really low quality image. Thank you, remove.bg, for absolutely downgrading the image. But, you know, we ball. He is a very, very well built individual. There is not an ounce of that frame that is wasted on an ounce of fat. Like this guy is pure muscle 190, uses it very well. This is my type of player when it comes to buttery smooth hips. Like he is just like super fluid. I love that. Again, I've been saying that with the majority of these corners. Ridiculous movement ability. And again, really good frame. A lot of people, when they look at him, it's like, oh, he looks a little small. Mm -mm. This dude is pure muscle. This dude's almost 200 pounds. Like, holy shit. Like, really? I didn't even know that. Watch him play. This guy will go straight up against Rosemead Jack Saint and just go step for step. Don't even care about what you're doing, right? Like, he can just handle it all. I love that. Now, when it comes to zone coverage, a little bit better than adequate. Still developing there. But I literally saw a bulldog. This guy wanted to get messy with these receivers. He wanted to get into the box and assist and be able to just destroy the running back. I love it. And you know what I loved even more? One of the first run plays I see in a lot of the corners, they have this issue. They like to go for the play, right? And so they have all this sideline and they crash down and they leave all of this open for the running back. He did that. He didn't seal the edge properly. The running back bounced out and they got a good game. I saw after that week, multiple times where he almost started doing it. And then he took a right perfect angle to where he essentially gave a little bit of a gap in between where he was and where the rest of the defenders were. And he pushed the running back up the field. That is high IQ right there. And that's patience. And that is also taking it for the team because you're not getting the tackle there. He also then would close in and then help assist them in the tackle. So rather than potentially allowing 15, 20 yards on a completely open stretch of field, he allowed one to two. That is awesome. I love seeing corners rebound. And that's what exactly what he did. This guy deserves a lot of credit. He gets none. He showed out versus a six foot six, 230 pound wide receiver. He did not care. And this guy really is special. So keep your eye out on him. I think that he's going to be a day three target that ends up being a true corner one on a team in two years. I love him. I really do. And um, maybe I end up being a clown because I believe in somebody who is not that great. But I think he's pretty freaking great. And the thing that really irritated me is I looked at his stats, specifically for the Missouri game. He had like a 38 PFF coverage grade. And I'm like, I got to watch this game. Why the hell? Like he allowed a touchdown, didn't get a pass breakup. He never allowed a touchdown. In fact, I watched, I believe, all 60 reps of that game. He had one bad rep. And, you know, he had, I think, three or four passes caught on him. They were five yard outs where he was playing 10 yards off. Where was the play? Where was the touchdown? There was no touchdown against him. I don't see where that happened. And he also had an interception that got called back for an offside, but it was a beautiful interception. Guided the receiver down the sideline on a fade and put, he was in the perfect position, looked back at the ball and got a beautiful INT. Doesn't get recorded. Of course it shouldn't, but you're really not going to factor that into a coverage grade? Hmm. Interesting. Because there's something wrong with that. There's something really wrong with that. So we'll see what happens there. Uh, pick number two, not pick number two, at spot number two, we got Quinion Mitchell. Uh, Quinion's a beast. Obviously, you know, I don't really need to be the first to say it. He's somebody where 433 speed, right? Six foot, 200 pounds, good arm length, tons of pass breakups, interceptions, you know, this is the guy, and I forgot to change the damn A plus color to purple. We'll deal with it. Ah, that hurts me because I really do love 
being able to make sure every little fine detail is okay, but we are going to survive. Uh, you know, this is somebody where ball skills, that's his game. Granted, it's because he does leave some good separation with the receivers and he just has really good recovery speed. Got to throw that in there. Uh, I talked about it earlier with Cooper DeGene as well. When they play off coverage, which they played a lot of, the timing just wasn't really there at an NFL level. Like the, the, the quarterback threw the ball, relatively solid timing, didn't have the same velocity as NFL quarterback. And Quinion got there at the perfect time. Same thing with Cooper DeGene sometimes. That's not going to be the case in the NFL. Quarterbacks are going to ID that you're off the ball. They're going to have a higher velocity on the football and it's going to get there before you do. I think that will easily improve, but it is something to watch. And I think that he will and has shown the ability to be a really good press man corner. And I'm praying to God that he goes to a team that really loves to use physicality. The three teams below are indicative of that. Uh, Obviously has a great frame. And I think that he's going to be a very solid player. So there's nothing that I have really an issue with with Quinion Mitchell. I just think that he is almost a savant in press man coverage. Utilize that. Enjoy it. Profit from it. And let Quinion be able to develop too. So I'm very excited to see him, especially on a team that has draft capital to move up, just filled their holes in free agency as well, like the Packers. I really do want to see them utilize some of those picks to move up and get the guy that they deserve to get. And that's Quinion Mitchell for them. And then, of course, at one, it's Terry Arnold. Like, who am I? Who am I kidding, right? Um, He's the only player with a two on the it factor. I mean, it technically goes up to three, but man, my skill has to be really shit in order for it to be up to three. Uh, Talk about a leader, right? This guy is super polished. Talk about CEO. This guy is the leader of a defense. Like, this is the guy who I want talking to the media instead of maybe my spokesperson. Like, he is fun to listen to. I admire his speaking ability. I would want to speak as well as Terry and Arnold. So that's a big plus. It's a big surprise because he's so talented with football. You don't really think that he has taken all this time because it requires a lot of time to be able to prepare for football. Like, like you don't even need to take my word for it. You just see a hard knocks thing. You see how much these players really grind in the NFL, let alone in college where they have to do classes and everything else to really elevate his oratory ability. Awesome. I love that. Props to him. Great job. He is honestly somebody who I'd want on my team. Um, he's my number three player in the draft. Very well might end up becoming my two or my number one player. That's how much I love him. Uh, you know, to be able to get into that S tier where I think you're a number one corner in the NFL, like right away, you have to score a 90 plus. That's a requirement for me. The only player who has ever naturally scored a 90 plus without my manipulation is Sauce Gardner. He is as close as I've probably ever gotten to wanting to put someone there. Joey Porter Jr. was around that spot too because I love Joey Porter Jr.'s, his overall understanding of the game and his overall learning ability. Uh, Terry and Arnold is right up there and they remind me a lot of the similar play style. Great physicality. They know how to get to the ball. Granted, he's better at picking the ball than Joey is. Loves to fight against the run. I mean, I saw Joey Porter Jr. go toe-to-toe versus Tank Bigsby. I've seen Terry and Arnold go toe to toe with some pretty good guys as well. And, you know, just great frame overall. Doesn't have the same length slash height that Joey Porter Jr. does. Hence why I say mini JPJ by actual stature. But this guy's phenomenal. I mean, my dream fits. I think he could go as early as four. I would say he should go at five. But, I mean, we'll see what happens there. But, I mean, a team like the Eagles where you have so many second round picks. Use those, dude. Use them. I mean, Vic Fangio is going to love this guy. I don't even care about Vic Fangio. Any DC is going to love this guy. He can play in the slot. He can play on the boundary. Hell, if you need him to sub in at safety, which would be stupid, but do it. Like, just put him wherever. Put him anywhere on the field. This guy's a guaranteed starter. Uh, To me, it's a pretty significant gap between him and Quinion. And that's not shade to Quinion. That's just showing how damn good Terry and Arnold is. So that is the video. Thank you so much for watching. Showing the love you always do. I love y'all. See you on the far side. Peace.